just like we don't pay tuition what we paid in federal schools for instance um, as against what happens in the private schools within the shores of this country there is like a uh, if i doing the mathematics when i was finishing school i added everything i spent when i say everything everything including accommodation deals it wasn't up to what someone in a private school would pay for a session everything i paid the six years you know i mm. spent in medical school so it's seen that medical education in the public setting here is quite affordable you know and cheap if i would use that word what is it like you're welcome to unbecoming a doctor podcast my name is dr gospel i'm a medical doctor a life coach and also a youtuber if you're a medical student an aspiring medical student or a medical doctor and you're keen on living a successful life throughout medical school and also having a fulfilling medical practice then click the subscribe button below I've been privileged to coach medical students in hundreds of numbers over the past couple of years. And I finished as the valedictorian of my set while building a sportsman and also cutting away numerous leadership awards. So I know the in and the out of medical school, how to live a balanced, a successful life, and how to also pursue the dreams you have aside medical practice successfully. So I need you to join me every week on Sunday by 12 p.m. on this channel as I bring you value ranging from succeeding through medical school, dealing with failures, and having the very, very difficult conversations on the podcast series I titled On Steady Waters, the typical conversations that everyone will run away from having. So definitely, I'm inviting you to join me every Sunday by 12 p.m., and I'll be seeing you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Gospel Ekototin here, as you all know. You're welcome to On Becoming a Doctor series. And we're continuing the recent sessions we've been having, which is on steady waters, difficult conversations about medical school. Everything people will tend to run away, usually those conversations that, you know, it feels like you're walking on tiptoes. So today we are having episode three, which is where we compare the foreign medical education as against what we have locally here within the shores of Nigeria. And I'm very delighted to have a co-host with me today. I'll let her do the honors of introducing herself. Um, hi guys, my name is Hidayat Ambeta. I am a medical doctor. Well, to be specific, I just finished my house job training. Yes, yay. And yes, I am very happy to be here. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us on the show. So talking about foreign medical education and our local medical education, mm -hmm. I've observed there are quite a number of differences. And for those who are aspiring to be medical doctors, one critical thing it's necessary that they have is information because knowledge is power weighing like the pros and the cons yeah both categories eventually will turn out to be successful doctors regardless of the pathway they took towards arriving there but i know sometimes in retrospect people may have one or two regrets especially with the fact that especially with the fact that they would feel like okay if they had if they were private to some information, they would have made maybe better choices as regards that. So we would look at this um, around, I'll just say about 10 different things that we can compare and make contrast with, with focus on the advantages and the disadvantages. So the first for me here is like the admission process. You now, typically back at home, one finishes secondary school or high school, to put it that way. And then we get to write what we call the O-level exams, either WAEC, West African examination, or the one we center here in Nigeria, NECO. And then we get to write JAM, we get to write the post TME, and then we are admitted into the setting here. Now, um, one of the advantages is that we are sort of familiar with the topics or the questions that will be asked in all these exams, because Education is like a continuum. We just build up up to that point. But then I think one disadvantage I've seen, honestly, like when I was about entering school, the total number of applicants for medicine in my school were 11,000 plus. That's a lot. Yeah, and mm -hmm. we were just barely 100, you know, that eventually got into. So that's like 1%. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a disadvantage because we have people reapplying to study medicine every year. Some people say they've applied up to six times and they get it on the seventh time. So I think that's a disadvantage in this mm -hmm. instance. So what was it like for you getting into medical training abroad? Okay, admission is actually very easy. It's, it's, it's just very straightforward. If you have the grades, you're going to get in. Uh -huh. If they don't have the space, they'll tell you before you even waste your time to apply. Uh -huh. 
And I feel like um, that's maybe one of the reasons why people start considering going outside. Like you said, the tedious nature. I mean, just think about psychologically what it will do for you, like applying for one thing seven over, times. Over like again. it's and then going in and then spending years, 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 years on it. You understand? So, um, okay, for us, up to the point of writing the wayak and the neko, it's the same thing, but you don't need jam. You don't really need any other exam apart from that. So for the school that I went to, I studied in Egypt. So they'll just, they have like a grading system where they calculate scores based on your wayak or your neko. Oh, that's nice. So um, once you get to that, I can't really remember how they do it, but once your score is up to that, is you're just in. For some schools in Egypt, you still have to do maybe English exams like IELTS or TOEFL or something like that. But that one is, you know that you have to do it before you get there. And you know the scores that they require. It's seven and above. Okay. So it's, it's, it's just, you're not going in blindly. You're not going to, you just know that, okay, if you go there and I have test papers and my score is up to this, I'm going to get the score. So admission process is really not that hard at all. So it's quite straightforward. It's quite, it's very straightforward. Yeah, okay. So, so now, because when we look through all of the things we'll be looking through today, mm -hmm. some will be like majors and minor. Now, for those of you who are listening and you want to make a choice based on what we'll be discussing, you know what is non-negotiable for you. Mm -hmm. If um, you can, you'll be able to afford foreign medical training. It's one of the things we'll talk about later on, the affordability. Mm -hmm. And you know you do not want to waste time at all. Like, you just want to get done with high school, get into university training. I think this would be a very good option for you. But let's go along and see. Now, the second will be the curriculum and the teaching methods okay. with a focus on comparison between theoretical training and mm -hmm. then like the practical training and the hands-on experience, mm -hmm. as well as integration of technology and the exposure to different specialties. Mm -hmm. um, from my interaction over time with those of you who trained abroad, I know sometimes people make comments as regards the fact that the practical mm -hmm. aspects it's sort of limited in some yeah. settings either yeah. because of racism or some mm -hmm. bias even maybe language barrier as the case may be but back home here yeah, um, I, I think we have quite a balance of that mm -hmm. the theoretical training is quite good solid even sometimes it feels like they push us too much because we're always reading 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 having to study you know books and all of that and then on the practical aspect, there's really no limitation. It's just mm -hmm. as much as one would want to go. Mm -hmm. Even though sometimes the competition between residents, interns, and the very motiv motivated medical students, you know, mm -hmm. can be a bit stiff. I think we still have, you know, that leisure to have our hands on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I know there's a limitation in terms of our technological prowess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Sometimes we hear from those who have gone outside now and they, it takes a while for them to adjust to either the devices, you know, that they are having to work with there as against here where a lot of things are, you know, sort of manual. So what was it like for you going to school? Okay, um, for the training, the theory, I don't think there's a problem with the theory. They're very thorough too. But the clinical skills, it was a lot different for us. Mm -hmm. So like for me, for example, I've noticed that um, when I started interning here, that the medical students actually come to the ward and see the patients there. And it was a lot different for me because the patients were brought to us. So let's say, for example, we have a topic on hyperthyroidism, right? Instead of going to the ward and meeting CKD, da, 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 maybe Addisonian crisis, hypo, hyper, they will just bring maybe like two different hyperthyroidism cases to us. So it's just us and the cases in the class. So they'll start, so it's, it's more... Um, how would I say, you're just going in depth on that particular topic and nothing else. But then the advantages of that is that you're going to learn the topic well yeah. because you're just seeing the patient. Yeah. And even when you come to the exam, you know, there's no distraction. You'll just remember, you remember. how the patient sat, what the patient yeah. said, what this, 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 this. But the disadvantage is that is in real time practice, they don't just come with one thing, you know. Yes. And if you don't see the patient's in their critical states because they won't bring a critical patient to class to states for us you know understand uh, the patient has to be let's say clinical patients the yeah. patients coming to clinic right so somewhat stable so you wouldn't really know how to identify let's say a thyroid crisis or this or that 
because I noticed here that the medical students actually come to the A and E calls, yeah, you know, exactly. So they can go in and they'll actually see it. So for that, I think it's very deficient. It's quite deficient on that um, end. And then when it comes to like technology, God, when I started O and G, <laughs> I could not hear the fetal heart rate at yeah, all. With our local, I could not school. count. Okay, fine. I knew that. Yeah, you could maybe put your hand and count contractions, but, but it was just all that stress? it was just something yeah. that you know we were told that people do it, but we didn't see it because a CTG machine is like standard. Counts the contractions, monitors the fetal heart rate. If there's anything below that, you know how to indicate it. You know how to. You don't have to be constantly going there thirty minutes, thirty minutes, and it's putting way more the peanut. Exactly. But sometimes even the residents they find it difficult picking the fetal heart rate. <laughs> exactly. You know, okay. And so yeah, I think that part um, shocked me a lot. But also, um, there's also something I want to talk about, like nursing skills, like putting a catheter, cannula, NG tube. We were taught that there were basic nursing procedures. So uh, there weren't really a lot of emphasis for medical students to learn them, you know. It's just like, okay, yeah, we'll read about it, NG tube, this is what you do before you do it, this is how you do it, this is what and maybe you practice on a mannequin or something. But there was no like force for you to actually learn how to do it on a human living, breathing yeah. human being, you understand? Because there it's just a standard, it's just a nursing procedure. Even if you graduate and you become a doctor. You're not going You're not to be doing that because be exactly. Doing, okay. So when I got here, the shock was that you don't know how to pass cannula. <laughs> you don't know how to do this, you know? And I'm like, okay, I think maybe they should have actually put a little bit more effort on teaching us how to do it, you know, there. But then maybe the people here should be less judgmental about yeah. it also. Yeah. Because these are things that you there's no way that you'll pass through a whole year of internship and not learn how to do these things true you understand true. so it's yeah i think that's just what i have to say about the whole training thing. that's fine um the next will be we've we've addressed it partly now the clinical exposure in terms mm. of availability of training centers mm. patient load and the diversity of cases now i know back at home here we have quite a number of teaching hospitals. I mean, like we were based in Abuja, for instance. Uh, there are like three tertiary centers I can think of, you know, of hands. And then we have the general hospitals, which are like the secondary level of care. And it's like that in most states in Nigeria. There are like at least two to three, you know, efficient training centers, if I'll put it that way. And again, with a comment on the patient load, I would even say it's too much because, you know, currently here, for those of you who want to come into the medical school setting in Nigeria and then, of course, maybe training at some point, we know like we are, I think, like number 198 in terms of the WHO index for patient to doctor ratio. So okay. we are overworked most mm -hmm. times because our primary health care facilities are not working in most instances. So we are seeing every kind of patient you can think of. Sometimes as basic as malaria, patients are presenting at the GOPD. And those things are things that should be taken care of at those levels and they would have to refer you know when it's complicated and beyond yeah. the control so that the tertiary settings are not overburdened yeah. so with regards to patient workload i would say it's even too much so we have enough way more than we even want would like to have yeah. you get so but what was it like for you over there okay um I had an idea of what burnout looks like because mm -hmm. even like them, my seniors, my professors, blah, 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 I could tell that they were tired and I could tell the patient load was a lot for them or blah, blah, blah. Or then they, that's how they said it because obviously we weren't really as, um, we weren't really um, into incorporated into the whole system like how. But when I got here, I saw burnouts like people are working on empty no right. people are working in fact if there's anything below empty that is what people are working on and then it's not the patient's fault yeah yeah it's not the patient's fault because they do have to come and seek help um they Definitely. do have to but it's it's a lot it's it's a and it's just something that i can't really i don't know if it's what exactly is the cause? Is it that there's a deficient um, number the Japa, of healthcare? Japa okay. Most of our okay, doctors are true. going outside. So if if 
We're saying this now because if you don't want it, it's good, you know, sometimes back home they tend to pride on the fact that they are stressed. And I really don't see the sense in it. Yeah. You know, like we get to see a lot so much. And you can literally mm -hmm. see these people that they are not really happy doing these mm -hmm. things sometimes, but no one wants to say things, mm -hmm. you know, as they are. You don't have mm -hmm. to be burnt out while working. So if you have a setting where you have, you know, what is ideal, what is enough, you can still go home, be productive, do other things. Not that you're going home and all you're thinking of is just, you know what, I want mm -hmm. to eat, I want to sleep, you know, and that's all. So that's not what we, that's, we're not having that, you know, leisure here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for some, in some instances, we get to do weekend calls. That includes Saturday, Sunday, and, you know, you resume work by 8 a.m. on Monday. So it's like you're working for 60 hours plus, you know, at a stretch. And if there are nights where you didn't get to sleep, it's usually hell and terrible. So that's mm -hmm. not something, you know, would wish or want someone to experience. So you need to be informed if you're coming into this setting. And in some schools, like, you know, where I train to, very good training center, sometimes they will stretch even the medical students. We have to stay for calls till morning. Uh, a few times, you know, we just get to escape, you know, make an appeal mm -hmm. or want to go. You know, they release us maybe 2 or 3 a.m., but sometimes we have to stay till morning. And you're coming back to class, you're drowsy, you know, and all of that. It's not something that anybody would be happy or excited about. When you're learning, you should learn under a reasonable and sort of calm atmosphere. So if you're the type that you will not want to be stressed and strained because i feel like the two of them they are different you can you can deal with stress but strain kind of hits you hits you in your soul and you know you are like tired and fagged out so yeah that's something you should put into consideration yeah and i feel like when it comes to service too, because the whole point of medicine is service to humanity right yeah. the quality of healthcare is yeah. is it, it you'll see a lot of cases and there'll be a lot of people to learn on and from but you will not be able to do everything currently. Sure. Like for an, for example, when I was in endocrinology unit here, we had a patient with DKA. She came in a night prior, that was during my call, and then we stabilized her and everything. And the following day we came for rounds, she was on 5% extra selling. And I'm very sure the person that put it up there didn't, it's not because the pe the person just feels maybe negligence. Let me just yeah. hang it the fluid. The pe the person is so tired. The person is so overworked that the person can't open the folder to, to check that this is a DKA them. patient. The person just hung five percent dextrocyline. That's how she went back to DKA again. So yeah, the quality of healthcare isn't the same when you're burnt out. Yeah. But yeah, okay, just good work. So moving on to research opportunities, I will let you go first for this one. What's research like abroad um, from mm -hmm. the junior level of medical training, okay. even as you progress up to the senior years? Okay. So um, when you say research, do you mean like group project or do you mean like community-based research? Like Let's say group the projects. The big dogs. Okay. Yeah. So for group projects, um, we usually have, I think, two or three per course in a semester. Oh. And there's two that you're going to do on your own. So single, singular group project. And then there's one that's going to be, you're going to be grouped. So um, the singular one, it's it's just, you know, the basic things. Maybe they'll give you a topic. You'll go research it. They'll have, you know, the standard, um, the fonts, the number of pages, the this, the this, that. Uh, you'll have a supervisor. Chapters. Exactly. Something like that. So that's just your own. But I think the main hassle for me was the group project. Because it's easier for me to work by myself than to work with people. And I feel like if you are becoming a doctor, if you're entering this whole setting, you have to know how to be a team player. Yeah. And I feel like those projects capitalize on that a, a lot. lot. Yeah. A lot. Because so. what you end up with is um, maybe you'll have maybe one group leader that ends up doing everything or maybe some slackers that don't yeah. really do this. So what they do is each part will be divided. So, and for each part, there's um, sort of like um, something like a breakthrough point or something like that. So when you reach a certain point, you have a supervisor that goes over it. And it's not just for every stage that you are at, a different person presents at that stage. So um, it, it, it like, it brings everybody in, everybody has to participate, you know, everybody has to do their part. And then finally you come and then you defend your project and then it's, 
I feel like it, it's it's fun. It's a group. It's a team building experience. But at the same point, it's like educational. It teaches you the basic of research and stuff like that. But although I have to um, emphasize that they never really made um, a hassle on like the quality of what you do, right? Okay. So it's, you know, like here is, um, okay, your reference is, where did you get the reference? Yeah. Who said this? Everything Can you quote the, this? Yeah, they weren't really like that. They were, I think they, they focused more on like how you do the work rather than the exact, not that they would accept like um, nonsense work or something like that, but I feel like we weren't really per cost on the content of what exactly because you know here when i see like the residents presenting they're like okay yeah, die your line you said great. go back to your presentation die your line you said this you said that you yeah. know how can you defend that where'd you get it was your reference you know that it wasn't like that it was more of okay there's a body of what you're saying do you understand what you're saying it can you relate it to somebody does it make sense okay do your references do they check out in general instead of um uh, thorough land my life thing. I think that's that's the only difference. Yeah, I think I would have to say at this point that's mm -hmm. that's way different from what happens here, mm -hmm. and it's an advantage for you guys in a sense because here in most instances, unless you have a student that is highly motivated, mm -hmm. self-directed as well, we typically don't get to have a feel of risk. We do presentations, but not. The classical research pattern up until mm. final year in medical school okay. so for someone who um learning the basics of research literature review you mm. know co-authorship and all of that is like a big deal for you that's a huge yeah. plus it's best yeah. you get your hands on on these things you know early on because for me getting to final year and having to be meeting research you know i've, I've heard mm. about it a lot of times mm. seen people present and it really wasn't something I was, you know, focusing on. But immediately I got to final year, I realized I needed to do my project myself. So yeah. I was binge watching YouTube videos on literature yeah. review methodologies. And you know, it's learning. a lot when you want to learn it all yes, at once. Yes, all at <laughs> once. So it took it took a while to finally get a grasp of what was happening. Luckily mm -hmm. enough, my project partner had been doing research for like three, four years. So I saw the gap between herself and you know myself and i was just like in awe so um if you want research to be something do while you're here if you're again highly motivated you can, you can link can up still, with residents yeah, and some consultants yeah. they really wouldn't mind having you you know attached to the publication even officially you get or if research is a big deal for you you probably have more opportunities to sort of learn you know, hearing from her now as a foreign student. Mm -hmm. But again, if you decide to stay back at home, it would mean that you just have to push yourself to learn the basics well and get that checked up. And even if they're stuck here, they can still learn it. Yeah. If there's a lot that is learned after medical school. You don't have true, to learn everything true. there. That's so very true. You, you, should, you, you don't have to learn everything at once. Mm -hmm. You have a whole life of practice mm -hmm. ahead of you. See you in part two of this video. Thank you.